Hello, hello, and welcome everybody to a new episode of Running from Cheetahs with Nikita and Emily. I'm Nikita, and this is my charming co-host Emily. Hello. Uh, I'm really glad you stayed with us. And didn't run away. Thank yeah. you. It's so nice. No, I wouldn't run away. I love you guys. Yeah. I also I have to say I missed the show a lot. It was a big break now. Yes, a month and so two months. Actually. Yeah. Maybe even a little bit more. Yeah. So I'm glad we're back. I'm glad we have a new guest. And today with Yuji Boyka. Thank you for being here. Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, would you introduce yourself to our guest? Who are you? What are you doing? Uh, I'm 41 years old physician from the University Hospital here in Pilsen. Wait, and you're 41? I would 41. Give, I would give 35. Oh. I will be 29. <laughs> <laughs> now you're flirting. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, but unfortunately, unfortunately, I feel much older than than 41. And uh, yeah, now my uh, hair is short, but before they were quite grey. So you would realize I'm not as young as it might look. Like. So, yeah. What What is your What is your specialty? What are you doing? Uh, well, basically, originally I'm an internist, so my specialization is in internal medicine, but uh, from the early beginning I did intensive care medicine and uh, I did my second specialization in intensive care medicine. And also I focus now much more on the emergency medicine. So you are an alcoholic, basically? Uh, some people say so. You like Okay, you <laughs> can see that. We will yeah, we, we'll ease in uh, the interview like we usually do, and uh, we're gonna talk about the professional things in a little bit. Uh, first, uh, yeah, I will just pour myself a little bit of wine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not so, drinking a lot today because last interview I was just drinking, and so today I'm yeah. just take this away from. Would you also like a little bit? Yes, uh, yeah. it's yes. hard to distinguish the cola and the wine. Yeah, the coke. Yeah. This is for the police. <laughs> yeah. and this and this is the original one. Yes, I did. I think uh, uh, also you you told us that you were into wine. That's why I also got a uh, bottle for us. Uh, I'm not a wine person at all, so usually I choose wine depending on the just the label. Um, you also told us that you're uh, a movie person. You're really into movies and. Uh, to be honest, I don't remember last time I was in a cinema. Me neither. Mm. No. Me neither. Now that I think of that. Do you mm. go to the cinema yeah. like? Last yeah, time? because I expected the Dune from Denis Villeneuve really passionately. And uh, I really must have gone there to the cinema and uh, I've, I've seen it. It's just great. I love those expensive expensive Hollywood movies on the large screen and uh, I'm a sci-fi fan and uh, so I enjoyed it very much. It, it's definitely a kind of movie that you have to see in the cinema. Yes. Yeah, yes. and uh, I think it's an epic production generally and I uh, I wish I would see it in cinema too. Uh, have you seen uh, actually the previous version of it? Um, from well, it's a long time ago. It was in, yeah, it was in 1984. In yeah, the, the, the deal from 1984, David Lynch, yeah. and I didn't like it. Yeah, yeah I, it, it was, yes. I mean, if you compare those two, now it is like this big uh, cinematic experience, yeah. and the previous is more of a stage play. Yeah. But it is funny, I have to yeah. say. Yeah. And uh, I think that if you know Denis Villeneuve as a director, and you, you saw his previous movies, mm. that you already know that uh, he's really great in doing great sci-fis like the Blade Runner and so on, the, the, the second Blade Runner did it and uh, it's really an epic movie as well, so I like the way he does those movies. No, now I have a question though. How do you feel about the Joker, the performance of the, in the movie, like Joker? Well, if you mean Jack Nicholson as Joker, well, because in the in the original movie there yeah. was uh, Jack Nicholson as as a Joker, and I loved that. It was mm -hmm. 
typical Jack Nicholson enjoying his role and so he the was your stage. favorite Joker. That was my favorite Joker. But when I saw the the new mm. movies um, from Christopher Nolan, Christ, yeah. to be honest, seeing the the first movies from Marvel, then I really enjoyed them and. More and more, I fell into the Marvel space, and the last Avengers. Well, maybe it's too much of everything. Mm -hmm. It's more and more show and show, and the story a little bit vanishes. But mm. but still, uh, the way how it's filmed, I like it. And uh, who's your favorite Avenger? Uh, Iron Man. <laughs> Mine too. No, wait, I like Iron Man, but I also love the Hulk. The, uh, he the, smashes everything. Yeah, yeah. Who doesn't no. like him? I was, I was thinking, do you see yourself a little bit as a Batman? Maybe, you know, you like, you like during the day you're a regular person, at night you're fighting death, you know? Because you're... you're fighting death, basically. He's you're right. basically well, Batman. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes in the emergency de department we, we fight stupidity more during the night. <laughs> Not... What's the most stupid thing that has ever happened there? Well... Almost always you see guys coming after, for example, four years of having back pain and coming at 2 a.m. knocking at the door and it's really urgent and I need my therapy now. And uh, honestly, at night when I don't work, I'm a little bit nervous. I need to work on my shift. Yeah. I, I hate just sitting uh, on the chair and waiting. I really hate it. But it's also a good sign when there, there are no, mm -hmm. really no patients and nothing happening. Well, it means that everyone's healthy and everyone's fit, so... Mm -hmm. is, is it good though? Because you don't have to think... It's, it's, it might sound bad, but when, when the emergency room is full, that's exciting. For, for the doctor, but the patient is... Yeah, from the point of view, uh, the doctor, nurse or medical student, it's... It's very nice. It's, I mean, it's it's interesting. It's of interesting. course, it's interesting. It's interesting, motivating, and so on. And uh, it would be even more for the medical students if they could see it, uh, for example, in the pre-hospital care, you know, when they go with us on, on, on the ambulance with us at night or with the helicopter, and it would be much more exciting. Wait, you go on helicopters time. often? Well, you mean at night? Anytime. <laughs> well, <laughs> usually... Is it your favorite means of transport? <laughs> I would be nervous. Well, well, here in the Western Bohemia, uh, our average uh, it's our average is about 1.5 flights per day. So it means one or two flights in 24 hours. But it changes a lot. So there are days when you don't have any incident, any accident happening everywhere and you just sit at the base and wait and then you have days when you are the whole time in the air, so... <laughs> for, for students who might be interested generally in um, going in the direction of an intensive care medicine or emergency medicine, is there a possibility to somehow maybe uh, also participate in the pre-hospital care and uh, maybe go on a shift with a doctor. Mm. Do you think that something like this is possible? Yes, definitely. Uh, so uh, I'm always willing to offer anyone from the students to join me in the emergency department or if they are in this interested also in the pre-hospital care. We can arrange that. Mm. It's not a problem. So, so it's just up to the students. Okay, so this goes out for all of you. Uh, <laughs> not all of you, <laughs> we, don't have, <laughs> we don't have buses. At the... <laughs> no, but if somebody is really, he, he thinks his passion, his or her passion, uh, is in uh, maybe in emergency medicine, then uh, yeah, maybe uh, they should contact the teacher during classes, yeah? Or maybe you direct me? Uh -huh. Does it sound right? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Well, you can find me uh, each Monday in the intensive care unit in the first internal department and each Wednesday 
in the emergency department. So whenever you come, we can we can discuss it and arrange something. Guys, I wouldn't miss this opportunity because I heard it's pretty good. So I would <laughs> I would I would go. You you heard you you experience in life right now. <laughs> yeah, doctor's pretty chill. I like him. <laughs> Um, your so to wrap up the movie theme, we, you said that Christopher Nolan is your number two. What was the number one? Well, honestly, Christopher Nolan is number one, and Denis Villeneuve is, is almost, is like almost, the, same almost yeah. the same because because my most favorite movie of all times is The Interstellar. Okay, and I really like it. So, and that's Christopher Nolan's movie. Yeah, the, the what I don't like, uh, the only thing I don't like about this movie is that everybody just gave up on Earth and decided to go somewhere else. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't think we should be doing that. I think we should put a bit more effort into trying to save this. Yeah. yeah. But otherwise there wouldn't be a movie, so... I understand for plot, <laughs> for plot reasons we need to have it like this. Well, yeah, but maybe it's our destiny, so... Yeah. Yeah, so... Maybe, maybe it will be like this, that we just will have to leave Earth in the near future and move somewhere else. Who knows? For me, still, I'll be dead, so just... <laughs> <laughs> what, what about favorite actor or actress? You have mm, that's quite a difficult question, but we mentioned Jack Nicholson and I really like this guy in every movie he, he just filmed, so... Jack Nicholson is fine, but now from the younger ones, uh, well, I like Brad Pitt, I like Leonardo mm. DiCaprio. I like them too. And, I mean, they're good actors. Uh, yes. Uh, I like... Uh, yeah, I forget his name now. Maybe, um, maybe the movie. Yes. Uh, the one who in the Christopher Snowlands Batman he played the bad guy in the third movie he's Tom Hardy sorry ah, yes. Tom Hardy yeah, yeah. yes and um, yeah so he's pretty good yeah he's pretty good yeah and then Daniel Craig as James Bond that's my favorite <laughs> one <laughs> what about oh. actress uh, uh, maybe maybe. Uh, Natalie Portman. She's good. Yeah. Her performance in Jackie, mm -hmm. it was superb. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Even the accent, she nailed it completely. Yeah. I really like that. Yeah. So, I think Natalie Portman. And, uh... I like Jennifer Lawrence. She's good. Yeah. Yeah, she's good. And yeah. Viola Davis is very good. Mm hmm Oh, I know more than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> what about... Um, a viewer is asking, what about Denzel Washington? Yeah, Denzel Washington is fine. He's amazing. Yeah. He's very good. I really, really like I haven't him. seen him in a long time in movies, though. Yeah. Uh, maybe. You think he gave up? I don't know. Maybe he's on vacation. I don't know. <laughs> on vacation or something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what about your, your other passion, sports? I mean, we yes. see you're a very sporty guy. I wish I would look like that also with 40. Uh, no, I used to be as really highly sport active. Now it's much worse because of the lack of time. Yeah. And uh, also I have some health issues that re really slow me down from doing all the sports I would like to. But before, yeah, I really enjoyed doing all kind of sports. So my my father is uh, he's a physician as well but he played professionally football so uh, really yeah he's uh, I... he, he won the Czech uh, Czech League in 1982 which team is his name also Yuri? yes yes I found you know? him on Wikipedia <laughs> <laughs> no, really honestly, honestly I was because Okay, we, I always Google our guests before the show because sometimes very interesting things come up, you know. Uh, and I found this website and I thought, no, you cannot be this old. Uh, this might, might, But I wanted to ask you actually if, if it's a relative of yours. Yeah. Because he studied medicine as well in yes. Pilsen. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Very yeah, fun. Yeah. But yeah. which team did you play for? Uh, he played for Dukla Prague. It's mm-hmm. uh, it, it was a famous famous club in Prague. Not anymore. Now it, it well it still exists. Now okay. they play I I think the second league. I think so. But uh, previously it was a very very famous and popular club in Prague. So and uh, he got the chance to play against FC FC Barcelona mm-hmm. in, in no. No Camp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. We have some photos at home, and uh, he has quite good stories from that game. I need so to talk to your father. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's so nice. And since we're talking about football, what's your favorite team and player? My favorite team oh my was God. always Manchester United. Oh. And uh, it was just because of uh, when I started really to support something more, be like a fan more, I, I saw a match Manchester United against uh, Newcastle United. It was in 1996. I was at the time sitting with my dad in Malta in a pub. We were on vacation watching just football in a, in a sport pub. And uh, I was just, just, uh, yeah, just uh, extremely, extremely happy about Eric Cantona, how he played, and uh, he became my favorite player. And I started to support Manchester United. In the time. It's a very good club. You guys have had Rooney. You guys have had Pogba. Yeah. I think even Ibrahimovic played there, right? Yeah, and uh, and uh, now Ronaldo. And now Ronaldo, but but. For me, Eric Cantona still remains number one. Which position yeah. did he play? I don't know. About he was him. a midfield player. And in 1999, when Manchester United won the triple, mm-hmm. like uh, English Cup, League and uh, Champions League, that was just Wait, they amazing. won all of that in one year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the, the final game in Champions League against Bayern Munich, when they scored two goals in the 89th minute and... Uh, 92nd minute. <laughs> <laughs> you remember it was, it was, it was it really, crazy. really. That's that was the most famous game of all times for Manchester United. I think so. And one more question: When the World uh, Cup comes, which uh, country did you root for? Because okay, you're Czech, but except for Czech Republic, which country would like? Germany. <laughs> I like I like German football as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> so it's like a neighborhood solidarity, would you say? Or uh, no, 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 no. I, I, it's my personal choice because I always enjoyed the style they played. That they, yeah, they never yeah. give up. Yeah, yeah, that's true. They never give up, and uh, they, never they, yeah, and they really so what? had and have excellent players, and. Uh, so Germany and then then I always supported a little bit England but I expect every year more and more and they don't like deliver that. yeah they don't really play as so well so. and about what about tennis for example do you like you said you like tennis yes I I like really watching tennis and um, I also play tennis but but uh I'm a bad player, so... Yeah. <laughs> so who would you rather, Nadal or Federer? Well... It's a tough question. Uh, Nadal. Mm, why? Uh, he seems to me more friendly and nice guy. Like Federer, for me, is that Swiss guy. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so and I enjoyed the way Nadal played more than Federer, but but I really really respect for Federer for everything he did in tennis, and he's an excellent excellent tennis player. And I also was fan of Djokovic, but now nowadays after the whole uh, the whole Australian Open Australian Open affair. It was quite it's a questionable. Disaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pity for for him, mm-hmm. for the whole tennis, and uh, for his career. So. Yeah, I, I feel um, many elite uh, 
sport figures they kind of fall into this a little bit alternative mm-hmm. um, trap that they I don't know maybe do, do you think it has to do with this obsession with you know taking the best care possible of your body yeah that uh, yeah I, I I really think so that that they see themselves as healthy fit sport guys who really don't need to do anything special about their health they're always uh, they have the best care and uh, but he always was a little bit more ezo like okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah more than the others so it did not uh, did not surprise did not surprise me so much when he did what he did in in Australia but I wasn't happy about his attitude yeah, at all. Yeah. I, uh, but I, I was thinking more Sorry, because he knew yeah. the rules. Yes. He knew the rules. Okay. So, and he didn't want to obey and he just wanted to somehow pass around. So... Inacceptable, right? Yeah, yeah. What for, was he thinking? Yeah. For someone who should be, who should be some form of idol for for yeah. kids and so on so it was not uh, it was not lucky i think so. athletes should have that in mind that sports is a way that you can inspire people and your attitude matters exactly. a lot because you have little kids watching you yeah. and through sports we can learn a lot we can learn about sharing with others a little bit about compassion discipline which is extremely yeah. important and if an athlete doesn't have this thing so where's the fair play that's as yeah. important as if you're scoring for me yeah. Yeah, but I think it just mirrored the whole COVID-19 era, how the, the, the both sides and both opinions, uh, pro and contra, uh, how they passionately reacted to, to the whole situation. I think it was really, really un- unlucky for, for tennis and for sport. Yeah. Um, maybe last question concerning sports is a bit more personal. You said you had some health issues. I don't know if you want to disclose it or anything, but I just wanted to generally ask you, how do you, because I also like sports and uh, I had some injuries myself. And how do you approach injuries? Because I think it hits somebody who is into sports quite hard to not be able to do the sports that he or she likes. What is your attitude towards it? How do you try to maybe compensate or go around it well i need to or i have to uh search for different types of sports yeah i just can do so different movements and different sports so that's the way how i do it i cannot i cannot really run too mm-hmm. much i have some some uh some joint issues my my right hip is totally destroyed so can't run so I need to swim I need to take my bicycle uh, skiing is fine mm-hmm. and ski wait wait is you fine. still ski yes I, I still ski. I tried to do that thing it was a disaster and my <laughs> butt was red because of how many times I was popping it was a disaster mm, don't worry it will it will come it's just a matter of training oh no I'm not gonna go, yeah. go there again you <laughs> know but I think it's it's interesting Skiing and snowboard, I think it's they are different, but this the technique I think it's the same, right? Well, it's similar, similar. I do not, uh, I don't do uh, snowboarding, <laughs> just I did it, I tried it a long time ago, and I didn't like it uh, too much, and I still prefer skiing more, so I cannot give you any particular advice about snowboarding. I'm not that kind of expert. I'm terrible, so for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we uh, transition then to our next part. Yeah, we have, have a, a little, game. Let's have a little game. I hope it's not chess. I'm really bad in chess. It's not we chess. We promise it's not chess. <laughs> it's, the game is this, is this one. We will show the doctor some group of pictures. And he's an emergency uh, medicine doctor, so... He would tell us who, who it's safe. 
Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So imagine, imagine you're, for example, in the football field. There was a big catastrophe. <laughs> exactly. And then, to whom will you run first? Because maybe this person is a national treasure, or it's just uh, they you know, are the national lesser, treasures. <laughs> they the are. lesser of the uh, two or three evils, you know. What I mean? Which one would you save, and why? You know, in a mass disaster during the triage. I just cannot look at the faces. Yeah. <laughs> I just need to know the vitals, but okay. So in this case, uh, come on, save, uh, Messi. save Messi. Come on. Yeah, I think Lionel Messi. So sorry, Cristiano. Why Messi? Uh, I think he's not that kind of egomaniac as those two guys. <laughs> That's true, actually. Maybe okay. he is, but for me, as a regular uh, TV uh, TV uh, fan, mm, he seems to me to be the really most shy and. Uh, I thought you would say nice Ronaldo guy. because of Manchester United. I know, I know. Sorry, Cristiano. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next group. Let's see. Having some technical issues, we'll be back. Okay. Um. Yes, which one would you say? So there we have Roger, Roger Federer, Federer yeah, Serena, and Williams, Serena and Venus. And Venus. Williams. Which one would you say? Uh, Roger. Nikita, which one would you say? Um, I have as much uh, opinion about tennis as I have about football, which is none. <laughs> I think I've seen the guy on the left once on <laughs> TV. <laughs> <laughs> I would say Roger because because I prefer male tennis more. Yeah. As a as a fan. Okay. Sorry, ladies, but but women's tennis is a little bit boring yeah, I would, sometimes. I would, I would save the one in the middle because she she looks like she's in pain. <laughs> I would save Serena yeah. actually. Yeah, Serena. Wins. <laughs> but okay, next one. Ooh. Which one would Ooh. you say? Yeah, this one's tough. Mm. So it's Rihanna. Yeah. It's uh, Shakira and Penelope Cruz. And Penelope Cruz. You want to sing a song from Rihanna? <laughs> no, no. You can. Uh, in this case, uh, I like them all, so I would do my best to save them all. But in case I. I have to choose. Uh, I really like songs from Rihanna. I like the way you think, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. I would totally go for Penelope Pen 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 Cruz. Really? Yeah. There's an, uh, no debate. Which one would you save, sir? Mm. Mm. So, so we have Trump. Yeah. I would save Donald Trump. Yes. You would save Orange Man? <laughs> you would save Orange Man? You would yeah. say him? Yeah. Why? With all the respect, I still think there were some positive things he did. And I can't say that everything he did was a complete mess. Yeah. Okay? So, so in comparison to, Th to Thanos, who wants to kill half <laughs> of the mankind, and uh, Xi Jinping, who's the leader in, in China, I th still think that uh, Donald Trump, uh, at least there's much fun with him. So it's a lot of fun with him. So he's the funniest of all. Things. Yeah. I remember yeah. being depressed because of exams. Not depressed, but feeling sad because of exams. I would watch videos of Trump. That's how. And I was one day I was eating Indian food, and this guy made a joke that he looks like tikka masala. Uh -huh. So it was hilarious. <laughs> But yeah, so 
Now we're done with the game. The next set of questions is about yeah, let's your do, uh, professional. Yeah. yeah, I just want to say, yeah, let's. we're going to skip the memes. We just do add it a little bit. Yeah, um, so we're not too late with time. Yeah, I wanted to, but this is maybe a little funny um, <laughs> transition to a more, maybe more serious topic. We wanted to, to talk also about your... Uh, your your job your profession yeah and uh, what I would like to ask you uh, is uh, this was a sort of a little stupid um, uh, philosophical question yeah whom would you say first but do you uh, are you confronted with those kind of ethical questions in your uh, in your daily work yes of, yes of course uh... So, as I mentioned, especially well, these these ethical questions. The usually, uh, in my case, um, they come with the it's the end of life question, for example, mm -hmm. or or uh, is this patient a candidate for intensive care or not? Uh, not already because. Uh, he has no reserves, his quality of life was very low before he got to the hospital and so on and so on. So yes, I have to cope with ethical questions. Yeah, do you... Is it... Uh, um, I mean, there are of course like extensive guidelines, I think, on those, those things. Um, and... Um, but do you feel sometimes maybe bad because you have to make choices that uh go against your ethical or your personal principles so i try to avoid do any choice that would go against my ethical uh ethical attitude and uh, because i always try to do what i think is the best for the patient mm -hmm. and then i'm fine when I'm fine medically and ethically with my decision, then it's fine. I'm unfortunately pushed sometimes into these uh, ethical problems. But uh, as I said, I try to avoid anything that wouldn't that uh, wouldn't let me sleep right. So, so yeah. Um, I have uh, like I was I was yesterday. I was just looking into like maybe. A few scenarios that could potentially happen in the emergency room, and I I thought they were interesting, and I would like to hear your opinion about it or how it is handled in the daily practice. Is an example being, for example, that that somebody comes to an emergency room and there are uh, signs of of violence, and you know that this was probably done by another person, and maybe it's done by uh, the husband or uh, the father or um, some close person that is in a relationship like uh, I imagine it's been quite difficult because and maybe imagine this person is protective of the other one so they don't want to immediately uh, the police being contacted mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. they don't want to even disclose that it has been done by uh, by a person that is close to them. Yeah. Like how? What is your approach to this scenario? This is extremely difficult and it really depends on the situation. So in general, you are obliged to report any criminal act or suspicion of a criminal act to the police. You are obliged to. That's, that's, you have to do that. But of course, there are situations when the relative the, the victim, the wife, I don't know, the girlfriend, she just, uh, she just uh, refuses this and uh, doesn't want to uh, call the police. And then it really depends on the situation and uh, it's always a matter of a long, long discussion where sometimes you need to involve someone else like a psychiatrist or or uh, we do have some uh, some uh, we do have a team of uh, interventions that intervene in uh, in these uh, hard uh, uh, 
family and life situations and they are really trained to discuss it with uh, mm -hmm. with the person and and sometimes you find some solution but it's extremely difficult so there's no no advice I could mm -hmm. give anyone I can imagine it's also difficult to find private time and space in an emergency room because it's such a chaotic place exactly yeah. you need time you need some quiet area where you can discuss it and optimally you need some team to support you mm -hmm. and to support the patient mm -hmm. i have a question it's like more of curiosity what's a typical day for you for example you no know, doctors they have their routine and everything but for example you wake up but at six at four how when do you go home like, i i'm very curious about this thing. Well, usually I wake up quite early. I just can't sleep and I have really sleep disturbances because my my inner my inner time machine got broken <laughs> many years ago. Years ago. <laughs> Ages ago. <laughs> so usually I wake up around 4, 5 a.m. And I try to sleep, but when I can't sleep, then I go out and I do, for example, some physical activity outside, just some basic exercises in the forest and so on, or I go for a swim. And then usually I go to work and it depends on the day in the week where I currently work. Because Sorry, where do you swim for in the morning? Well, in the, in the swimming pool here in Pilsen, they open at 6.30. Which one in oh. Slovani? Yes. Really? Yes. Hmm. Good to know. Yeah. And in the, to yeah, in, the yeah. in the summer, I go here to the, to the ponds, to Bolovec yes. Rybnik and so on. So. And um, so it depends on where I work, whether it's in, in the hospital or uh, in the um, ambulance car or in the helicopter emergency medical service. So, so you do rotation in those two? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so, so my week is a little bit messy because from Monday to Wednesday I am usually, usually uh, in the hospital, in the ICU and the emergency department and in the, uh, in the second half of the week I usually rotate between the helicopter and the ambulance car. I find your lifestyle very stressful and the, the amount of stress you're under and how you emergency medicine doctors do it. It's just, for me, that, that must be very, 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 very disturbing because sometimes you're always on edge and you're always stressed and sometimes <laughs> it just takes yeah. a toll on you. Yeah, and you need, you need a perfect time schedule. Yes, need to be I, organized. My, my, my time plan is uh, really focused on seconds and minutes. <laughs> it's planned, really. Because I know that when I finish at the hospital and I need to be in 30 minutes on the helicopter, then it's quite quite busy and I, I always have need to that. hurry. <laughs> I wouldn't be a good man at that. I'm always late. <laughs> in the hospital, if you see this black girl running, that's me. Like running from <laughs> one place to the other. And trying to eat while running is just a mess, so that, that's not for me. But it's, I respect, I really respect that. Well, but there are many, many physicians doing it in this way. Mm -hmm. I have a question. If not internal medicine, what would you choose? Or emergency medicine, what would you choose? If mm -hmm. not these two. I think before that we have to ask, why? Yeah, why? Why yeah. Yeah, emergency medicine? What? Yeah, what uh, made you so interested in it? Well, as a medical student, I started to 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 visit my colleagues in the intensive care unit in the first internal department, and at those times there was an exceptional team of physicians. They later, all of them, they become. They became professors of intensive care medicine and they were extremely, extremely inspirative and motivating. Mm. And it was, it was for me as a young student, it was uh, really cool to just watch them during their shifts, how they worked together 
and that intellectual potential they had was just extreme. So that I liked the most and I decided to be also an intensive care uh, medicine physician. But uh, finishing the university, there was uh, no possibility to join the team. So for one year, I worked in the surgical department as a surgeon as a general surgeon and I really enjoyed it because also the colleagues from surgery they were really really friendly and uh, we had very good time but uh, my professor he knew that I will leave probably soon but he let me do all the things so I learned some surgical stuff it was cool and then I switched to well, internal medicine, but my primary focus and interest was always in the intensive care medicine. So that's how I ended up in the ICU mm. from the early beginning and focused on the intensive care. And then one day I realized that working in, an, in the university hospital where you can have magnetic resonance imaging at midnight mm. is a very comfortable job because you have always always someone to cover your back always someone on the phone or you can you can uh, you can invite colleagues from other departments just to help you just to support you and uh, i wanted to try the emergency medicine if i am able to cope with all the adrenaline situation on myself in the pre-hospital in the pre-hospital care so, so you, it, it sounds like you are a kind of person who is actively seeking out challenges <laughs> yeah at that, that time i really did it from this reason that i wanted just to have the adrenaline rush. yeah have the adrenaline and and somehow test myself yeah. if i am able to work without all the devices, equipment, and the, the personal support of colleagues in the hospital. Because in the pre-hospital care, you have to face sometimes really, really difficult situations with children, neonates. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that must the... be tough, working with children. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. I, I could never... Yeah. Stuff. Still, when I see that we have a, some, some serious problem in a child, I am a little bit nervous. Yes, mm. I have to admit that. Is, uh, because uh, you say you, you, you like this idea of kind of this raw medicine, so not have, be able to rely on all those modern uh, tools and equipment uh, is... Have you ever considered maybe being part of Doctors Without Borders or something like this? Well, uh, on the other hand, <laughs> yes. yeah, I, I, I considered that. But on the other hand, I like the good functioning system. Okay. Like, yes, you are a pre-hospital physician, you do it on your own, but always you can bring the patient to a super specialized facility where he gets the best care mm -hmm. and I can provide him with the best care I can. Mm -hmm. And here uh, you have 24 seven hours helicopter shifts covering the whole Republic. You have excellent net of, of university hospitals where you can get the best care. And this is what I like on the other hand that mm you you can bring the patients to the facilities they belong to mm -hmm. and being a doctor without uh, without more the, the uh, Maison Sans Frontières uh, mm -hmm. this is something you I would miss but I have a colleague my my good friend she's uh, uh, we met on a mountain medicine course and uh, what? mountain medicine course what do you do there yeah, well, <laughs> I'm just curious. You learn how to save people from avalanches and how to survive severe hypothermia, 
and how to really? cope with the hostile environment in the mountains. So yes, I do have a diploma in the mountain medicine. And, how do you uh, get to the, those places to get those? That's very interesting. Actually. Yeah, it is. It is. And uh, actually, you also learn how to prepare someone, for example, to go to the Himalayas so he doesn't get mount acute mountain sickness or how he can prevent mountain sickness. And, and you learn a lot about uh, saving people with uh, with injuries in the in the mountains and uh, so that's... you've done it all you have this this and that and... Yeah. you're basically Pilsen's Batman I'm not I'm not unfortunately <laughs> unfortunately I'm not so I think no. I think it's time for the game because yeah uh, well, I had I had a question on the tip of my tongue but now I kind of, for... I kind of forgot it yeah um, yeah, would you, uh, yes, there are, because you, I mean, I guess you experience a lot of really uh, crazy things uh, in your job, but can you share maybe one story that like stuck in your memory? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's the most horrific story for me and I never want to experience it once again in my life. And that was, uh, that was two years ago, I think so when I did my uh, ground ambulance, uh, ground uh, rescue service shift and we were alarmed to, uh, to a car accident where was a young man, he was, he crashed his car against another car and when we came there he was obviously dead but we tried to resuscitate him and uh, unfortunately he died. And that's not the story, but that's the beginning. And we were quite full of adrenaline and uh, we were really unhappy how it ended and that we couldn't save him, but unfortunately we really couldn't. And uh, as we were going back to the base, we were alarmed, uh, and it was here in Pilsen, we were alarmed to a young lady with uh, child delivery. So childbirth. So we went there hoping that we have time to bring her to the hospital. But when we came there, it was really very, very stressful situation because there were the family members. Everyone was just shouting and screaming. And uh, the lady already, the, 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 the delivery of the child already started. Mm -hmm. So the birth, was on run and I knew that we have to deliver the baby on site. Mm -hmm. So that's always a little bit stressful for everyone. But yeah. as I said, all right, we have to do it here. I phoned to the to the dispatch center mm -hmm. to send us, we have an ambulance with the incubator and the, the life mm -hmm. support, life support box for the neonates that we have to deliver the baby on site. And when I checked the lady, I realized that the baby, it's a pelvis, uh, pelvic end delivery. So the child yeah, the is in the breach presentation. Yes, it's in the opposite yeah. way. So, and this is something you really don't want to experience pre-hospitally. Yeah. This is something that stresses even the most experienced, uh, experienced Ob obst uh, uh, obstetricians. obstetricians. Yeah. So, and uh, always as I go somewhere, as a, uh, as a physician, emergency physician, I always have my B and C plan, like, what will I do when this goes wrong? I will do this, and I will do this when this goes wrong. Mm -hmm. But here, in this case, you don't have any B or C plan, you don't even have the A plan, because mm -hmm. you just hope it will go smooth. So... That was that was crazy, and uh, we delivered the baby. Mm. Surprisingly, we were able to die. Needed to do some maneuvers, but we got the baby out. Was in cardiac arrest, and we resuscitated the baby. Mm -hmm. the, the The lady was fine, quite fine. So we we just stabilized her, and we resuscitated the baby, and uh, and the baby opened the eyes. Oh, thank God, I've and been then, here, uh, then, <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been here. And started to cry, and yeah. then uh, during the transport, I hold it before I put it in the in the box for the neonates. 
it, uh, it was uh, it was a girl. She just looked at me and was quite happy. And we brought the lady and the child to the hospital. And name of the girl is Jane, and she's fine. She's right. doing well. But but the whole scenario That's was stressful. extremely extremely yes. stressful. I would say I'm quite ready for the stressful situation and trained at these days so i'm not stressed because of cardiac arrest or and so on and so on you have algorithms and you know how what to do but in this situation it was extreme extreme pressure not only on me but on the whole team mm. that was there and i have to say i had an excellent team there inside yeah. we have a question from the audience so who are generally members of the emergency team uh, how what uh, of whom is the emergency team composed if you mean in the emergency department there uh, you have the physicians and the nurses on the on the ambulance car we have that fast car mm -hmm. where there's only the physician and trained paramedic or trained nurse mm -hmm. and on the helicopter there's the physician and there's trained flight nurse. Mm -hmm. What is a flight nurse? Flight nurse uh, is a nurse that's uh, specially trained uh, for for air rescue or helicopter service. Mm -hmm. nice. mm -hmm. But the military personnel flies the helicopter, is it right? Here in Western Bohemia it's a military, a military uh, helicopter and it's mainly military uh, personnel there. Mm -hmm. So, me personally, I'm a civilian working for the army, but uh, the helicopter belongs to the Czech Air Force. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. uh, so, if anybody has uh, still questions to our guests, please post them. We will try to address them if we have maybe a couple of minutes in the very end. Otherwise, uh, I think it's time for a very last game. Yeah, and. <laughs> Although we are the unofficial podcast of the, uh, of the Kals University, we're still I still consider us as a educational. Yeah. And yeah, of course. I think we are. We yeah. are educational. We're just drinking grape juice here. Yeah. We are educational. I think it makes us better generally. The wine, that yes, one? yes. Yeah, I'm very chill. I'm very nervous. So I think we're going to need a little space. So because we want to be educational, we have we thought of maybe a few. A few scenarios, yeah, like emergency scenarios. Do we need uh, Stuart now? We will need Stuart now, yeah, that we can play out real quick. And you can maybe repeat with us just the basics so our viewers, you know. Yeah, it's, Stuart. It's now you Stuart cannot too. repeat okay. the, the ABCs often enough, isn't it? Okay, so this is Stuart. This is Hi, my friend Teddy Bear, so we yeah. better take care of the teddy bear. This yeah. is Stuart, guys. So yeah, this is our patient. Yeah. So what? What? <laughs> like, if if for example, like we're walking on the street. Stuart's with walking. Stuart. Yeah. Yeah. We just he's an unrelated stranger, <laughs> and then all of a sudden we see him collapse on the street, and then what? What should we? What should we do? Uh, oh, oh my God! There's there's a person, and they're not moving. What is what? Are, what are we supposed to do? Oh, Stuart. Okay. okay. So approach the yeah. person. Yeah. And uh, are there any signs of life? So it means, does he move? Does he breathe? Is he somehow active? So you come and say, hey, hey guy, or if you know the name, hey Stuart. And he does not react to me at all. Mm -hmm. And if I suppose he's an adult guy, then at this moment, I should alarm the rescue service. So I'll take the smartphone and I will activate the dispatch center saying, here's someone, who's not breathing and uh, come and help me. And if I'm a lay person, so I'm not a physician, mm -hmm. uh, they will give you advice how to do that. So they will start the telephone assisted mm -hmm. uh, resuscitation. So you will go, uh, you will go uh, with the smartphone uh, with the sound on mm -hmm. so they speaker. can hear you or uh, if you have a smartphone and you have the check uh, check app called Zachranka, mm -hmm. it's the best app for saving science life because really? it's the yeah it's the fastest fastest way how to activate the rescue service and it also immediately sends 
to the dispatch center so the signal your they know direct you position oh that's nice and not only to the dispatch center but when you are in the mountains it alarms also the professional mountain rescue service and if in the summer when you for example are at uh, some huge lakes mm -hmm. whereas the water rescue service they immediately it also immediately alarms the water rescue service and it allows you also to go with the with the camera on so the dispatch center can see what's happening actually on site that's so nice. yeah so this is the most useful app in my smartphone mm -hmm. so when i armed the dispatch center they sent the rescue service I need to start the resuscitation. Mm -hmm. So it means that you will start pushing the person's chest with frequency about 100 to 120. If I'm just a lay person, mm -hmm. as a physician, you always, the, the approach is a little bit different, but as a non-physician. Yeah, let's assume we're a completely lay person. Yeah, mm -hmm. then yeah. you will start with pushing the chest, the the frequency is uh, or the rate is 100 to 120 per minute, and you just stand up and push the chest mm -hmm. like with this. straight arms. With yes. straight arms, yeah. with your body above the patient's body, so you can use the your weight mm -hmm. to really push the chest in the middle of the sternum with your fingers like this, mm -hmm. so your hands do not move, mm -hmm. so like this, with your elbows straight, straight, and you just push. If you want to, you can also breathe with the patient if you know how to do that. Mm -hmm. It's still recommended, but usually the lay person, they don't do that, but if you want to, you can, and then you, after 30, uh, 30 compressions, you inhale two breaths mm -hmm. and then you continue with your CPR until you're either extremely tired and you cannot continue and yeah. you just yeah. fell down or until the professionals come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you, do you carry with you always like some equipment? Do you have it in your car? Yes, I have a huge, I have a huge bag in my car. What does he have? Well, uh, there's there are some splints, there are some plasters, uh, there's even adrenaline and IV infusion, yeah. and there's also the C collar yeah. for neck stabilization. And well, I used it a lot, uh, many times. I need to get my priority sorted. Yes. If I had a backpack, it would be full of food. But I need to get my priority sorted. I do also have some sugar there. Yes. Like for, the, for, the, in this thing. for the hypoglycemia. Of course, so of course. I yeah. would have vodka, but to sterilize, not to drink, but to sterilize. <laughs> of course, of course. I think it's 6.30. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Would you, sorry, would you bring us uh, a kitchen towel? Yeah. Yes, very nice. Okay, so, so we it's... have an, um, another scenario. I think it's not for me, it's for the kids, it's right? For, it's for here. Yeah. So we have another scenario. Um, we have here some fake blood. <laughs> yes, and some <laughs> random equipment that I found at home. So imagine, uh, imagine I have been riding my bike to school in the morning and then I have fallen, yeah, and... Uh, and now I'm bleeding severely from my arm. So, and then as you, I, here are some things that you generally might find in a, like a car emergency <laughs> set. So I just brought them with me. Wait. You can choose whatever you like. We have some, uh, some actually sterile gauze mm -hmm. uh, to measure the temperature. Uh, mm -hmm. If you, <laughs> uh, maybe a tourniquet. Uh, scissor, scissors and uh, some very tiny uh, plasters. Yes. So now imagine I am bleeding profusely out of my arm. Oh my God! Ah, it it hurts so much. I I, I oh, think God. I'm feeling I'm feeling a little dizzy. Okay. Ah. 
So if it's if it's uh, it depends on the severity of the bleeding. If it's obviously arterial arterial bleeding, then yeah. the most effective thing, if you have gloves, would be perfect. Is direct pressure in the yeah. wound. So just I will just start to compress mm -hmm. the wound, and I will shout for help because I don't want to really relieve the pressure. Now I'm compressing the artery and I need someone to help me mm -hmm. uh, in case you're not cooperative, okay, or yeah. scared and so on and so on. In case there's someone else who can help you with the direct pressure, then you can really keep on, uh, on the pressure. Should I do can... anything? Yes, if you could open another gauze, please, okay. it would be just great. Please, okay, here. Emily, I'm bleeding out. In okay, the just chill. <laughs> You're not helping. Okay, yeah, one more so gauze. Okay, this is one here. Any more? Yeah, it would be perfect if we had one more so we can make a uh, pressure gauze, but it doesn't matter. If we don't have, we just try to... You would die if it was just for me. Yeah, I we swear. would just try to... Something. Sorry, more, more. I still, more. still... The need? Yeah, it's okay. Still, with the pressure on, we will try to stop the bleeding. In case it's not possible, mm -hmm. and the patient is still bleeding, even with the direct pressure, and you have something like this, yeah. you can try, you can try to do a tourniquet. And uh, this is too soft, wouldn't probably help, but if, it's, if you have a professional tourniquet or something more firm, Mm -hmm. You can try, especially in the extremities, like uh, move it around the soft tissue and really tighten really it, tighten it yeah. very, very tightly. And uh, what if what if I would now, for example, start collapsing? Yeah. 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 So if you start collapsing, and I think I stop the bleeding, then there must be some. Either the loss of blood was too large, mm -hmm. or you are just, you have some other medical problem, other, other medical issue, and you, you still need to go to the hospital. So, if you want to prevent the patient to bleed out, the only thing you can do is direct pressure on the wound in case of very severe bleeding and a tourniquet, mm -hmm. okay? Then uh, of course there are some maneuvers that uh, you should keep. You should keep uh, the arm high. Yeah. So, but yeah, this is just the, the it's it's not as important mm. as the pressure on the wound. I think it's also good. Um, sometimes simpler is better because yeah. people remember it. But I think that's why, for example, the the the, the breathing was omitted now from. Yeah from the, the those rescue breaths because it's e the, the easier it is the yeah. more likely yeah yeah it is for people to actually do it and actually uh for example the military personnel they are really trained when they see when they see a, a bleeding wound they just go and they put their hands on the bleeding wound and yeah, yeah. you want this so one it's... I, I, I think it's enough yeah thank you very much for this demonstration <laughs> Thanks to yeah. you, he's okay. If it was yeah, just for yeah. me, I'm too slow. <laughs> <laughs> so let's check if we have any other questions from the audience. Oh, uh, I don't think so. No? No, I think that's it. Sir, okay. this was very nice. Like when I saw you, you had this face like this. I thought, nah, bro. But you're, <laughs> you're nice. You're kind of nice. So yeah, thank you. Thank you no, very, very much. No, I thank you. I, I honestly don't know why you chose me, but thank you for the invitation. Because your pills is Batman. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, but it was very, very nice. I think I, I might pay you a visit to the emergency because that sounds... Very nice, and I have a lot of energy, so I need to take that energy out. Yeah, you all are welcome either in the ICU or in the emergency department. I so. hope you don't get tired of me and kick me out of there. That would be embarrassing. <laughs> so, yeah. No, don't worry. It will be fine. Don't ask too, too much questions, though, because... <laughs> <laughs> okay, and that's it from us. Uh, thank you very much to our guest, Yuri Kvojka. Thank you very much, my dearest co-host, Emily. Thank you, Nikita. Thank you, everybody, thank you, for sir. viewing. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. It was really cool.
Really? Yeah, I enjoyed it very much. I enjoyed it too. Okay. And I drank wine, so I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we're going to see you next time, hopefully. Take care. Have a nice Bye. weekend. Bye.